Well, hello, friends. Welcome. My name is Doug Baus. I am Vice President for Client Services with Money for Ministry and your host for our webinar uh, today, Disconnected and Don't Even Know It, Getting Your Organization's Team Aligned for Even Greater Impact. I feel like today is a chance to step back from uh, a lot of the daily activities that you might be engaged in and take a hard look at the rhythms and the functions that may be familiar, uh, but maybe aren't as effective um, as we once thought. And, to, and also in that, to explore a disconnect between frontline fundraisers, which is many of you on this call, and those in executive leadership uh, that are helping guide and lead the decisions that influence uh, frontline strategy. I'm looking forward to it. It should be really fun. And we are so glad that you're here. Our audience today includes fundraising professionals from schools and colleges, rescue missions, broadcast ministries, mission sending organization, discipleship ministries, and so much more. Uh, a word about Money for Ministry. Uh, we serve faith-based and specifically Christian organizations from within the evangelical, Protestant mainline, uh, and Roman Catholic traditions. Uh, we're a planned giving growth company, and we want to see, this is our, our mission, every family have a, have a ministry in their will, and every ministry have a sustainable future. Since our founding, we've helped faith-based charities add well over a billion uh, to their legacy pipeline. As uh, people continue to log on, just a few items of housekeeping items and some details to go over. There's two buttons on your screen at the bottom. There is a Q&A button. Uh, click that. That will open a window where you can enter some questions as we go. Uh, we might take them as we go at that moment, but uh, more likely, and for sure, we'll uh, look at them at the end. We set aside a good 20 minutes at the end to take your questions, so look forward to hearing those. Uh, make sure to make good use of that. There is another button at the bottom of the screen. It's your chat window. It's a great way for you to interact with each other as you go. Um, not the greatest place for a question because I might not see it there, but we love it if you can interact with each other. And a question I'm curious about today as we uh, kick things off, what's the one thing, um, the number one priority for you uh, between now and Thanksgiving? I know for, for many of us on this call uh, today, we're right on the cusp of, or maybe even already in uh, the middle of a very important season, which makes me all the more grateful that you've joined us today. Uh, but help us get to know each other and what we're, we're working on right now. So go ahead, type that in the chat window right now. Uh, the one thing, that number one priority for you between uh, now and Thanksgiving. Uh, yes, this webinar is being recorded. If you're watching it live, we're glad you're here. But feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues that can't be with us live. And if you're watching this live, again, welcome. We're glad you're part of it. Uh, the, the recording will be sent out um, shortly after uh, the conclusion of the webinar. It's great to see you, uh, some of you writing in the chat, uh, some folks wanting to do some, showing some gratitude, lining up year-end visits, annual dinner, uh, getting to know donors on a deeper level. We're going to talk about that today, so uh, glad for that. Planning for some year-end giving. Um, appreciate uh, all the, the entries and things that people are saying. I'd like to welcome our guest today. Our, our guest is Andrew Olson. Andrew is on a mission to help leaders increase mission impact. Uh, by developing healthy cultures that accelerate revenue growth. And throughout his career, he's helped over 500 ministries and nonprofits raise more than half a billion dollars. He's built and led some fundraising programs on behalf of organizations like the Covenant House International, Museum of the Bible, the Salvation Army, Save the Children, and dozens of rescue missions and food banks across the United States and Canada. And uh, Andrew currently serves as Vice President of Fundraising Solutions at Dickerson Baker & Associates. And there he leads the firm's major gift consulting practice and oversees the organization's direct response fundraising. Andrew, welcome. Hey, man. Good to be with you. Thanks again for inviting me. We are so glad to have you here. Andrew, much of what we're going to discuss today uh, comes from some findings in a recently released uh, study conducted by Dickerson Baker. And in particular, we're going to explore how those findings interact uh, with planned giving growth and cultivation. So try to weave that in as well. But as we do, can you give us a little uh, context and background for this study so our listeners have a sense of kind of where we're coming from today? Yeah, absolutely. So every year uh, at Dickerson Baker, we conduct two different uh, market research studies. We conduct one uh, where we are um, we're reaching out to uh, C-suite executives and, and frontline fundraising staff 
to get a, a pulse for how they're feeling about um, about their organizations, about the industry and what's going on in, in the world as it relates to philanthropy. And then we also conduct one later in the year that we're actually in the midst of right now, uh, where we're we're having similar conversations with donors and getting a beat on on sort of how donors are feeling about the the industry and about their their own philanthropy. And so the the research we're going to talk about today is um, is research we conducted as we talked to C-suite executives and and uh, frontline fundraisers. And what we were really curious about, we we had some suppositions of, based on things we were hearing and, and seeing from some of our clients and others in the industry related to how, um, how organizations were perceiving their fundraising, the effectiveness of their fundraising, uh, and how fundraisers and C-suite leaders, CEOs, CFOs, you know, chief operating officers, those kind of folks, um, and, and what might be, you know, areas where their perceptions overlapped and what might be areas where there was daylight between them. And so we were very curious about that. And I think we've got some really interesting and insightful findings uh, from the study. I do want to say, I just saw a note from somebody in the chat, uh, and I think it's it, it's a fantastic idea. Some <laughs> I don't know who, who said it, but they said that one of the, that their priority was conducting stay interviews with their staff. Oh. So um, if if organizations aren't doing that, um, I would highly encourage it. So much of what we're going to talk about today comes down to how leaders are or are not engaging well with their staff. And so uh, kudos to whoever said they were doing state interviews. I think that's a brilliant idea. Excellent. Well, good. Uh, we are well. There's five themes that we really want to explore together today, and I'm going to introduce each of the themes, and then we'll we'll kind of talk about them um, sure. as we go. So. Uh, theme number one here, really, in, in this, an overwhelming majority of fundraisers desire new strategies for success, but at least half of them say they won't implement them. Well, interest. So talk about this disconnect. Why is it? What's behind that? Yeah. So this was an interesting one, right? So one of the questions we we asked uh, of of all the respondents, and we we surveyed hundreds of different organizations, got you know hundreds of responses back, and and we asked uh, organizations and 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 folks to tell us um, whether they thought that their organization was doing everything it should uh, and, and effectively in, in their fundraising, or if they needed new strategies for growth for the future. And an overwhelming majority of respondents across every level of organizations said that they felt like they needed new strategies for future growth for their organization, which we would agree with. We When we scan the environment, we see that the things that organizations were able to do successfully over the last couple of decades, some of those still work, but many do not, right? And so if we want to fuel and foster transformational growth in our ministries over the next decade, we've got to be doing things differently. And overwhelmingly, uh, respondents agreed with that. What was concerning and, and somewhat disheartening for us is that a full 50% also said they have no plan to change what they're doing. And, and what, what was very interesting is when we look at the breakdown between C-suite and frontline uh, staff, frontline staff were much more um, uh, open to the idea that they needed to change and they actually wanted to have a plan to do something differently. But the majority of C-suite leaders said, uh, indicated that they had no plan for change, right? And so this is where we first started to say, the disconnect that we thought we we were seeing in the in the sector is probably real, and and we'll see this as a theme throughout our our conversation today. But um, what we what we saw is that senior executive C suite leaders tend to have a more positive perception of their program and their organization and their work than their frontline staff do, and so you know. There's probably a number of reasons for that, and we're going to do some additional research in the market to try to get at this a little bit more. But what it tells me is that, um, you know, you know, there's an old saying that the, the biggest mistake in communication is assuming that it has happened, right? And I think in many cases, that's probably what's going on here, where, where a, a senior executive, an executive director, a CEO thinks that they've got a pulse on things, and their staff also thinks that that they've communicated the reality on the ground but neither of those two things probably are happening in an effective way. And because of that, separate perceptions exist, but the two, the two groups aren't coming together in a way that actually creates alignment and allows them to move forward in, in their ministry. 
Thank you, Andrew. We've had a couple of questions come in, just some clarity on definitions. Sure. So it's probably worth. Um, so C-suite, you want to just say quickly what you mean when you say C-suite? Sure. So that would be an executive director, a CEO, a president, uh, a chief financial officer, basically whoever makes up the very top level of decision makers in an organization. Right. And then when, we, when, when I refer to frontline staff, um, most of the respondents to the survey were, were people who held fundraising roles. So um, it might be a major gift officer, might be a major gift director, might have been an annual fund uh, director. We did have some um, more kind of development operations respondents. So that would be, uh, you know, maybe someone who manages a CRM for an organization or actually like someone with a title of development operations director or something like that. There were also a handful of folks that responded that, that are on the program side of, of uh, organizations, but that was a very small subset of the total responders. But, and, and I appreciate questions like that because it's easy, you know, we all use terms in different contexts. So uh, there was another question. This is going to take us a little off track, but I think it's worth going back to a stay interview. You want to, can you give a, a definition of, I, I think I know what you mean, but um, I made a, I made an assumption and moved on and somebody else was like, hey, what is that? So uh, maybe we could talk about that. So when, when someone leaves your organization, often an organization wants to conduct an exit interview. They want to learn from the the pain of someone leaving so that they can hopefully fix it for the the folks who are still there in uh, and and remaining in the future a stay interview is something that you do to try to uh, um to head off people leaving your organization so um it doesn't it's it's often not you know the the typical sort of annual review that you do with someone around their performance but it's intended to say hey you're important to our work and so we want to make sure that we're connecting with you in a meaningful and intentional way so that if there's things that are causing friction and making you want to leave, we can fix them before you put in your notice. And we can actually make this a, a, a beneficial engagement for everybody um, versus just learning from it when you finally get so fed up that you walk out the door. Yeah. And and uh, for the person doing this here this time of year, um, even more, uh, I mean, it just shows the value they're placing on, on that conversation, yeah. which I would wholeheartedly agree with. It's, it's important. So let's get back to this, uh, to the theme we were talking about here. Uh, overwhelming majority of fundraisers desire new strategies for success. For success. Maybe talk about some of these new strategies. Um, what, what do fundraising professionals want to shift towards? Um, and and what, what, what are they hoping to shift away from? And, and where is the disconnect or where is their alignment here? Yeah. So um, this one was also really interesting. You know, we, we, we asked them to rank the, the, um, strategies and tactics they they thought that they needed to invest greater time, effort, and, and dollars in. And this was one area where there was good alignment really across all um, responding groups. And what, what they told us was that they felt that the, the most important places that they should be investing in building new strategy is around developing stronger relationships, primarily with uh, mid-level and major donors, but there's also a very strong desire to develop better relationships uh, with what, what we refer to in the study as mass market donors, right? So that'd be the, the folks that are in your typical kind of annual fund. They're not assigned to a, a major gift officer or some sort of relationship manager. They primarily exist in maybe your direct marketing uh, environment or your, you know, they attend your events, things like that. But there was there was good alignment that relationship building at really every level of donor audience was a, an important priority um, and, and very significant. You know, over 70% uh, indicated that. We then said, well, if you're going to prioritize that relationship building with those key audiences, what are you going to give up, right? Because you can't just in continue to add and add and add priorities and, and activities and not release pressure somewhere else, right? And this is another interesting one where there was a good alignment and, and overwhelmingly respondents said, in order to build those relationships with mid-level, major, and even mass market donors, we think that the, the most important place where we should uh, divest of our time and energy and dollars is in acquiring new low dollar donor relationships. And I think this is a really important one, right? Because we see so often that organizations chase new. It's, it's hardwired into our brains. We get excited and there's a dopamine hit that happens in, in everyone's brain when they experience something new. And so it's really easy to get caught up in chasing after new. And new can be, you know, a new low dollar donor, it could be a new major donor, it could be a new, you know, legacy gift prospect. 
but the the idea that it's new is is what we chase after. However, organizations have have been conditioned and trained that the solution to all of their problems is more new donors. And that's rarely the solution to the problem, right? So being able to actually see it and say, well, wait a minute, if I invest less, and I'm not saying don't invest in new donor growth, that, that, that's not at all what I'm saying. But when we realize we have a finite amount of time and we have a finite amount of dollars, the, the greatest priority is to engage those donors who can move the needle the most and the fastest for our ministry. And, and oftentimes the way to that is mid-level, major and legacy gift relationships. And someone undoubtedly will say, but all of those start when you acquire a donor. And yes, that's absolutely true. But I'll give you an example. I work with an organization that has tens of thousands of ministry partners and, and they have one major gift officer to manage relationships, right? And so what, what we've been working and partnering with them on is to find budget strategies that would help them reduce their investment in acquisition so that they can fund that next position, whether that person manages major gift relationships, legacy gift relationships, or mid-level relationships, they will generate more dollars every year at a much higher return on investment by moving those investment dollars to a staff member to do that work than they will by ever adding more money to their new donor acquisition pipeline. It's just, it, it's a, a function of the fact that as, as our CEO says, big gifts just add up faster. And where you find that is in those relationships. Yeah, this is, uh, well, from a perspective of a legacy giving campaign, um, and, and I think most of our listeners are probably aware of this at some level too, but you you can't you can't take a new donor and make them a legacy donor. It just doesn't work that way. It takes Not time relationship. So if you're constantly, and again, you need to, you need to do some acquisition as well, but if you're not moving those donors along and deepening their connection and their relationship to you, uh, they're never going to get to that point of being mid, mid level or major, or of course, even legacy donors at some point. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's shift to this next theme here, because I think these all kind of build on each other. Uh, we must rethink what it means to have healthy, have a healthy fundraising operation including how we measure success. Let's talk talk about measurements. What metrics are pop, popular? What should we be measuring? Yeah, so I actually want to turn it to the audience here. If you'll drop in the in the chat what you think either what your organization's primary measure is for success every year or what you think the respondents to the survey said was the number one way that their organization measures success every year. I'd love to just hear what people think. Go ahead and uh, put your your best guess. Donor retention and acquisition. Donor retention. Good. Dollars raised and percentage of involvement. Dollars received. All right. What are you seeing, Andrew? Are you going yeah. to wait for a few more? This is an interesting mix. Yeah, it's it's good. And I, I, I think we're going to hit on some on all of this, actually. Yeah, yeah. So the number one metric that people said today is what their organization is measured on is gross revenue. And, and so that basically just means dollars in the door. Right. And and it's um, this is another area where uh, C-level executives rated this at, at a higher rate as being the number one uh, metric. The reason why I think organizations use gross revenue is that it's a really simple metric to track, right? You you literally just have to count the money. The reason why I think it's probably one of the worst metrics to track as, as a primary metric for success is that you can't spend gross revenue. Um, and, and what I mean by that is if it takes me 85 cents to raise a dollar, but I raise lots of dollars at that, my margin is 15%. And so very little of what I have left over at the end of the day can actually get onto the mission field and do the work that we're doing every day. Um, much more important in my mind, whoever said donor retention first, kudos to you, because I think that you know we, we need to be looking at donor retention. 
We need to be looking at donor migration. So how are donors moving throughout our organization and not just giving bigger gifts, but maybe giving gifts more frequently, engaging with us in different ways um, and, and sort of the collective impact of the relationship we have with that donor. And then ultimately net revenue and net long-term value are, are really the, the other two keys. And what was really interesting is overwhelmingly people said gross revenue is what we're measured on today. And then when we asked them, what do you think you should measure your success on instead, the two highest rated uh, categories were donor retention and net revenue. So there was a clear understanding that what we're doing today isn't right. We're just not there yet. And this is another one of those disconnect areas where when leadership and organizations aren't leaning into change and aren't pushing their organizations to think differently, because for, for so many of us, as much as we might want to change things, we all know that if a, if an executive director and a board don't get behind those, we can only push that rock uphill so far before it rolls back on us. And so really, in, in, from where we sit, the findings in our study are really a clarion call to the executive leadership and to boards that you you need to wake up and start thinking differently or or you're going to leave ministry impact on, on the field because you're not going to be able to do it if you're if you're both behaving the way you are and measuring the things you are you you might it might feel good to say we raised a lot of money but if you do it at a really low net um you're not going to be able to say we actually made impact can you talk a little bit uh, Andrew, about the, the I, I think there's a tension between, and, and you've hinted at it, I don't know if we've quite unpacked it, uh, giving today versus the long-term value of a donor. So sometimes acquisition maybe is focused on that giving, uh, you know, in the next 60 to 90 yeah. days, in the next six months versus what these mid, mass, and major level donors can do over a period of years and even decades. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, really anything in kind of our annual fund environment, you're, you're, donor acquisition, your direct mail, your digital marketing, even oftentimes event fundraising and things like that. Those are all geared to how do I make my revenue at the end of the fiscal year match the budget that I had at the start of the year, right? And, and you know, I, I talk about this in, in the context of for most organizations, we're living paycheck to paycheck the same way that many families are that live just barely above the poverty line, Right. And we might think we're doing well because we hit budget. And maybe if we do great, we're two to 5% above what we budgeted. But if we're not thinking about long-term stability and investing for growth over time, we're really doing a disservice to the people that we care for and, and the people that we're ministering to. And so, um, you know, that's not to say we can't, you know, we have to stop focusing on the annual things because you still have to do them. You have to have them in order to operate, right? But I, I think, you know, where, where we fall in this is we want to encourage and challenge leaders um, and, and boards particularly to think about uh, investment capital over time and, and starting to shift strategically to say, you know what, it might hurt a little bit in this quarter to take this money and put it over here because we know it's not going to generate an immediate return on investment like it would if we just signed a uh, you know, an approval to do another appeal, right? But over time, we're actually going to make a lot more money. And here's an example of that. I, I was working with a, a gospel rescue mission a couple of years ago, and we we did a, a campaign with them. It was actually a mailing where we didn't ask for money. We we intentionally said, let's not ask for money. Let's be so bold that the outer envelope is going to say, this is not about your money. This is about the impact that you make in our community. And, and we told stories and, and the goal was to bond the donor more closely to the ministry. And about 40 days in, the executive director rang my phone like I expected and said, September is doing horrible. We're, we didn't raise any money on that. And so I just kind of laughed and said, yeah, you're right. Like that wasn't the goal. Right. Um, and, and so it did create a short term budget deficit. At the end of the year, though, the people that received that mailing their their annual value was 49% higher than everybody else on the file. Wow. And so our, our point in that was when you invest in relationship, you actually grow the connectivity and you grow generosity by doing that. And that in turn delivers more long-term revenue and value to an organization. And not just in the mail, but this is what you get when you invest in legacy gift engagement. This is what you get when you invest in staff, when you build talent 
And when you drive meaningful engagement by having the right people, having the right conversations with your supporters, those are the things that move the needle on long-term revenue growth like you can't do anywhere else in an organization. It reminds me of uh, um, a story that I, I I heard recently from one of our uh, ministry partners about a donor who had been on file um, longer than they had record for. Uh, right, it goes back past the last data migration, which was in this case about 20, 20 years back. The donor had made gifts of seventy five a year, a hundred a year, fifty a year. There was one that was eight hundred, but then it was back to twenty five, seventy five. Donor stopped giving in 2018, 2019. Um, and in the, in the last uh, 12 months, they received a legacy gift for $169,000 from this donor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, now this is, now what's what's going on there? There's some long-term value where the donor feels connected, feels engaged, feels supported, feels thanked, feels appreciated. And uh, I mean, I've seen legacy gifts much bigger than that, but from a, this is a classic example of what that long-term value uh, can lead to. Now, that doesn't help you today, and that is that is one of the challenges. But um, it's a reality that we can't ignore. It is, and I think this is, you know, this is a little bit off topic from the presentation, but I think it's important to talk about it. Like this is why uh, I, I believe deeply that organizations need to think like like I, I wish that more organizations and more boards would invest in ensuring that their their entire staff understand the organization's financial strategy, right? Because it's one thing to say, we get our fundraising strategy. It's a completely different thing to say, we understand our financial strategy. And, and what's important about that is things like your investment capital and your ability to, with, uh, to withstand risk in your finances. Because there's going to come a day when the financial needs are greater, greater than today, greater than COVID, like it's just going to happen, right? We can't assume that the worst is behind us. And and if if organizations want to be sustainable over time and be able to actually uh, impact the causes that they talk about and that, that are important to them, then we have to stop living from month to month, right? And that means that we have to, to instill the fiscal discipline that says, we're gonna take these dollars and we're going to put them over here on the sidelines and not spend them on today's mission so that we can fund the the ideas and the testing and the strategic growth to ensure that we can actually be sufficient and, and grow to the point that we can care for tomorrow's needs. And a lot of organizations, particularly ministries, have a challenge with this because we, we feel called to solve the problem today. But if the problem is going to be persistent tomorrow, We've got to ensure that we actually have the capacity to do that too, and, and so this is where there's a there's a definite tension, and I don't think organizations talk about it enough. Let's go back to that. We were talking about metrics earlier, and you talked about net revenue, long term value. I'm curious about affinity. Uh, yeah. Should measuring affinity? How do we measure affinity? What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, affinity is critical, and I don't I don't know that organizations do a good job of this, or or a good enough job. This was one of the areas um, also in the study where, you know, we, we asked what are some things that organizations wish they could invest more time in. And one was building that sort of two way feedback loop uh, with, with their supporters. Right. So let, let's talk about surveys. I know you all do a lot of surveys uh, with, with your your clients. We do surveys as well. And one of the things that's always challenging is we'll, we'll, we'll conduct a survey for an organization and then we'll hear some semblance of. Yeah, we don't really do anything with the results because we don't have it mapped into our CRM. We don't have a somebody to, to put it in. All you know, what whatever these different you know responses might be, and it's all true. You know, all those statements are true. What happens there is we set the expectation with a supporter that hey, we want to know how you feel about this, and then a supporter gives us their feedback, and and the context that we need to understand that in is. The competition here is not the next charity down the road. Competition here is Amazon and Netflix and everybody else in the commercial world that has built beautiful and elegant feedback loops so that when I tell them what I care about, they begin to feed me back content and information that aligns with those preferences, right? And so when we don't do that, what we've done is we've actually broken a pro an implied promise to our constituent. We've said to them, tell us what's important with the implication that once you tell me, I'll start to act on that. 
And then we don't act on it. And all of a sudden the, the constituent says, well, you must not really care about me because everybody else that asks and, and then follows up on it, I can tell they care. But when you're so overwhelmed and so busy and you just didn't get to it and all that kind of thing, all you're saying is I don't matter, right? And so on one hand, I would say we absolutely need to be doing more things like creating feedback loops and getting that information and, and cataloging and collecting it, but only if we're actually going to be able to invest in making sure that we use that data to further future engagement and relationship building. If we can't commit to that, then I would say don't do those things right now because it's it's only going to leave a bad taste in the mouth of your supporters. Well, and I would say too, if, if organizations are he hearing this today and feeling a little bit overwhelmed, it can be, there are ways to automate this and scale it. So uh, sometimes a question that I'll get was, well, somebody put a prayer request in this survey and I don't have time to respond to all these prayer requests. Well, true. If, if there is a, there is a kind of a one-to-one -one sense that you really want to be careful about and, and treat with respect yeah. and care and not um, overlook, but it's also true. And we've helped, we've started to help ministries do this. You, you take the data, you can aggregate it and you can start to report back of what you've learned and mm -hmm. how that's yeah. influencing what you're doing. And it doesn't require a one-to-one -one kind of engagement where you're, somehow tied to i hear this all the time oh my goodness we you know we got such a great response now what are we going to do we got to call all these right. people it's like, well yeah. they're not all looking to be called right they just want to be heard right and the right you ask the question um and that you're that you're I mean, even a small reporting back on that can give them a sense of being heard without having you know you have to call and hey you said on point line 55 you know that this is you're concerned about this and blah blah you know like that's that can feel overwhelming and and i think absolutely it's a, I mean, I've got a couple thoughts on that. So first of all, if you have a newsletter or an email newsletter or some sort of regular impact reporting that you provide to, to your supporters, that's a great place to provide that kind of aggregated feedback, right? You know, we we surveyed our supporters and, you know, 3,200 of you responded and here's what you told us, right? Um, and, and that's a, a, a fantastic way to, to show that you're actually listening. Um, if someone raises their hand and and says, hey, I've had a bad experience with you, or you know, I have a concern. Those are the ones that I think need to be quickly filtered to someone to respond to, right? But I also think, you know, one of the one of the pieces of feedback we get often is we don't know how to manage a 52 question survey. Well, you know what? You can ask one or two questions, right? I mean, think about this. When someone goes online to give, they they complete their transaction. There's an automatic pop-up that comes up. And in most donation platforms, that page is customizable. It's very simple to add one question there, right? What, what is it about our work that's most meaningful to you? And then that you know, populates into your CRM or, or at least into a, a data file that you can import to your CRM. And that is a, a perfect time to ask a question like that. You know, any, any number of things like that, that you can add in a very simple way to create engagement and, and start to build those feedback loops. And then, like, quite honestly, if you don't have the staff capacity to make follow-up calls, to write notes and things like that, I get it. Most organizations don't. Um, there's a there's a guy on this call right now named Tom Hooper. He runs a company called Nimble Connect. If you need help increasing capacity to reach out to your supporters, to thank them, to steward them, to to have those conversations, to pray with them, Tom and his team are fantastic, and you should have a call with him. Amen to that. We had we uh, Tom was on a webinar uh, earlier this year and and uh, talked about that relationship building. So yeah, oh, I'm going to keep us moving here. We've got a few other sure. themes we want to hit. So uh, the third one here: leaders and frontline staff don't necessarily align on what it means to be an effective leader. How does this impact our work? Yeah, this one was um, was really surprising to us. And and I think it's it was it was one of those insights that just sort of hits you in the face. So we asked um, all the respondents to rank a variety of leadership traits and, and the level of importance of those. And and we did this with the context. So part of our business at Dickerson Baker is executive search and recruitment, right? So we talked to a lot of people at a lot of different levels. Um, both that that are interviewing for roles and that are being interviewed for roles, right? And, and oftentimes we talk to boards and and others that that are you tell us things like, oh, we need a a dynamic speaker. We need someone who's got 
you know, a strong presence and a commanding, you know, way about them and, and these, all, you know, all these kind of traits like that. Right. And, and that particularly board members want that, right? When we talk to boards, we often hear them parroting what you would expect of a corporate CEO, right? Although I think that's even probably evolving in the workplace. Uh, so that's that's what a lot of C-level executives said, was they they think those are the things that, that are most important. Frontline staff overwhelmingly said, we want mission, and we want uh, communication and we want relationship building, right? So if you look at this chart, those last four got the got the the most important as a, one, a number one or number two uh, elements: um, communication skills, inspiring trust, relationship building, and vision. That's what staff want. At the top of that, strong personality, strong record of accomplishments, confidence. That's what boards and C level executives said that they thought was important. And so it's it's also no surprise that when we asked the respondents to then rate their leaders on these same traits, we saw a similar disconnect. Uh, let's continue here. Uh, the next uh, theme, most fundraisers and CEOs agree they're not doing enough to engage supporters outside of asking for money. What do you mean? How, how do you do this on a mass level, a mid-level or a major level? Yeah. So this was a this was really interesting and and the the data actually is kind of confusing on it. I I suspect we're we're going to also end up doing a little bit more research on this question it's uh in particular because when we asked this question about half the respondents well all the respondents overwhelmingly said um we don't think that our communication mix is optimal. But half said we don't think we ask enough and the other half said we think we ask too much. So uh, clearly there's a disconnect around what the optimal contact cadence is and, and how to manage the percentage of solicitations versus the percentage of stewardship and engagement and, and feedback, right? Um, when we've studied this before and when I've studied this before in other organizations, one of the things that we found years ago um, was that donors would say things like, as long as there's meaningful feedback in between solicitations, we don't really care how often you ask us if there's a need, right? But if you're not reporting back, if you're not telling me how my gift was used, if you're not showing me that it was an effective use of my money, then twice might be too much, right? So I, I think that part of this disconnect has to do with the size of the organization, that smaller organizations may have a, a different set of pressures that they're dealing with than larger organizations when it comes to um, you know, the, how, how communication is, is balanced and weighted. Uh, but I also think that you know, most organizations, if, if you talk to uh, a fundraiser or a CEO and you said, how about we send another piece of communication that doesn't ask for money? They've largely been trained to say, well, wait a minute, if it doesn't ask for money, it's going to lose money, right? And and not seeing those, you know, someone once said to me, any stewardship touch point is a cost center in an organization, right? Not a revenue center, because they don't see an immediate correlation to revenue. Yeah. And so I think this is another one of those areas, like the example I gave earlier, where we have to reset our thinking and we have to say, there are certain things we do today that we expect the payoff on in 24 months, right? Or in 36 months. And we, we have to get more comfortable with this idea that not everything has to have an immediate financial return in order to be an effective strategy. But that really ultimately comes down to boards and C-level leaders and, and finance directors and CEOs saying to the entire organization, it's okay that this, this activity you took yesterday didn't result in a gift today. We know that doing these things drives future revenue and that's what we're invested in um, because without that, the incentive to do the things that drive tomorrow's revenue just isn't there. Surprising to me for as much as, I mean, you and I, and, and I think many of the folks on this call are involved in this, the, the transactional idea of fundraising seems so outdated and it's surprising to me, I mean, what your study is confirming is that, in fact, it still lives on 
at a pretty high level in a lot of different organizations that you're working with. Uh, and yet, yeah, I mean, hundreds of organizations responded to this across all sectors, right? So this is this is a pervasive problem. And for those of those of your uh, uh, participants on this call today that are involved in any kind of rescue ministry are going to understand this analogy. But um, transactional fundraising is like a narcotic, right? Um, it is it gives you an immediate high and then it's really difficult to get off of after that right because there you you get addicted to the quick win and and it's really easy for organizations to feed that addiction when i can say well wait a minute if i just sign this agreement and someone else will do all this work they'll have all the painful conversations with with donors they'll take all of that off my plate so i don't have to focus on it that's a really easy thing to say yes to but saying something like, well, wait a minute, I'm going to have to hire a staff person and then I have to train them. And then I have to have difficult conversations when things aren't going perfectly for them or for me. And, and then they're going to go talk to donors and have similarly difficult conversations. And then maybe down the road, that donor is going to give a bigger gift. There's a lot of maybes in that. And there's a lot of what feels like uncomfortable conversations involved in that. It's just easier to say yes to another email campaign or another direct mail campaign. And I mean, I, my entire career was built on direct response. So I'm not, I'm not knocking direct marketing. It does what it does very well. It just doesn't do the relationship building as well as, as other things do. Right. And so, um, but, but we've, we've built in this sort of addictive mindset and model into so many organizations because it's just the easy thing to say yes to. And, and breaking the habit requires you to go through the same kind of pain that you do when you detox, right? Um, you don't get that same immediate hit every day. And so it's, you know, I, I've said this to organizations before, if you wanna see what it's like for someone who's gone through a detox process, talk to a CFO when you kill a couple of mailings and they come to you every day and say, hey, what's what's revenue look like? Hey, have you seen any gifts today, right? It's, it's an eerie correlation. Um, and, and I don't say that to to um, to belittle uh, people who've gone through or who deal with with folks who are suffering through addictions. I think there's a very strong correlation between how we how we address addiction recovery and how we address the recovery from transactional fundraising. In my mind, there's a lot of similarity. Well, and that's probably a good uh, segue to our, our our last and final theme because I think part. We've talked about how this, and I think your study was was is getting at this at, at at a level to say, hey, you know, it's it's not transactional. It's about the relationship. It's about long term value. It's about the net, not the gross. Um, and and the, so the last theme I think maybe hits at this. Majority of fundraisers and CEOs agree that they need a new approach to engaging major donors, um, and and I think mid level and mass level donors as well. But let's talk about what's what's holding them back. We need a new approach. Why aren't we getting there? What, what's yeah? So I mean, the things that hold us back are, and, and you're right. Like, oh, there's an overwhelming uh, level of agreement for all the disconnects. Everyone has agreed that, like, yes, we need to do these things differently. What was really interesting is that when we look at, you know, what how many organizations thought that they had good structure and strategy for relationship building and development less than 30% said that they felt that that was the case for their organization. And for some organizations, it was like 8%, right? So um, what holds us back are the things that have made us successful in the past, right? So if, if what has made us successful in the past is a very mechanical, operationized, if that's a word, um, fundraising machine, then it's really hard to say, well, you know, and, and we wouldn't advocate for stopping those things, right? You have to continue to, to develop those relationships at that level and to build the capacities to raise even transactional gifts today because they still pay the bills, right? But you also have to have off-ramps in the relationship. And, and those are hard things to build in if you've never done them before. And again, Anytime you change those things, right, you, you mess with the recipe that works today, you're injecting volatility into tomorrow's revenue. And, and what 
organizations today want more than anything is predictability, right? I mean, think about the last four or five years. We've had so much instability in our revenue, in our programs, that I, I think leaders are so tired that they're like, well, if I could just get stuff to work the way we planned it, that's a win in and of itself, right? But that means we're going to be stuck on the same hamster wheel, right? And so um, we have to actually create volatility and we have to create breaks in the revenue that we create that we have today. If we don't already have a thriving major gift program, a thriving mid-level program, a thriving legacy gift program, in order to get there, we have to do things that are going to be painful in the short term so that we can mitigate future pain and we can actually be healthy in the future. But in the short term, it's going to hurt everybody. Right? And so I think most often the reason we don't do those things is because that change is painful. And, and if we are not aligned around the future vision and, and we don't have the, you know, not just the mindset, but we don't have the, the sort of spiritual wherewithal to say, we collectively agree that we need to invest in this and and maybe financially take a dip for a year or two while we while we realign our our priorities so that we can have these long term transformational relationships and, and giving engagements. If you can't get that alignment, it's just going to be cause friction all day long in an organization. And and I think that's oftentimes why great fundraisers say, you know what, I'm just going to go somewhere else that already believes this because it's too painful to try to fix it in an organization that doesn't yet believe it. There's a comment to that to effect just, just right now. I wanted to, there was something that you said in an earlier conversation that we, you and I had had that I think applies here. It's millennials and Gen Z give from relationships, which uh, and the, the equation was made to major donors. So if you're thinking about millennials and Gen, Gen Zs who are on the younger side, probably more in the mid to uh, mass level category, but they have now been trained, conditioned, and I think this is part of what the study revealed, they give out a relationship too, which again, steers us clear of that transactional approach, but makes us yeah. realize we need, to, we need to think about relationship at all levels of the donor pyramid. You really do. I mean, so we um, we actually, we, we, we believe so strongly in this that we actually trademarked the phrase relationship changes everything, right? And, and we also believe deeply that in order for organizations to be effective at their work in the future, they have to begin to treat every donor like a major donor. And, and what, what solidified this for us was the research, particularly looking at the younger generations around this, the, the two insights that give us uh, concern for the future for kind of legacy organizations is one, uh, the younger the audience, the less likely they are to align with an organization's brand, right? They are not the greatest generation that says, oh, we support the Red Cross because the Red Cross does great work. They say, we support organizations that are about changing lives in this area. We support the cause of saving girls and women from human trafficking. We support the cause of getting people off of drugs that kill them and destroy their relationships. They don't say, we support XYZ charity, right? So you're much more likely to gain success with younger audiences if you can disconnect your organizational brand persona from the conversation and make it about bringing that donor and your cause closer together. And that's really tough for a lot of organizations to swallow because they've invested so much in building that brand and building awareness of who they are. And, you know, the 100 the year narrative of their organization, younger donors don't care. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's just the reality. And, and then the other thing, because of their consumer behavior and because of how easy it, uh, consumer brands have made it to interact with their organizations, um, even when they give small dollar gifts, 20, 25, $50, Gen Z, millennials, and, and even some of the even younger generations now, they behave so much more like major donors. They want more access to leadership. They want more transparency in the work. They want a higher level of reporting. Those are all things that we've built infrastructure to support a couple hundred donors in our major gift program around, but we never thought that we'd have to build that infrastructure in mass to support you know, thousands of donors who want those same things. 
that's coming folks. And so if you are not building the infrastructure and the toolkit and the technology stack to actually support a mass level of personalization and bringing data and, and personalized communications together to do those things, you're probably gonna be in a world of hurt in the very near future because that's going to be the baseline expectation. All right, well, let's, uh, I, I do wanna, um, we've, we've, um, we've had a lot of great conversation here. We, we promised some time for questions. I do wanna get to that. Before we do the questions, we're gonna put up a quick poll. One of the things you can request in the poll is the uh, opportunity to request this report that we've been talking about. So if you wanna read it uh, from start to finish and get all the juicy details, you can click that. If you'd like to connect with either Andrew um, or someone from the Money for Ministry team to learn more about what we do and how our work can integrate and help you do this better. Uh, one of the things I, I don't want you to walk, anyone to walk away feeling intimidated or scared that uh, you know, you're not quite there. There are tools out there. We talked about what uh, Tom Hooper's team does to scale some of this. Um, there are other ways that you can scale this and make things um, uh, easier to do on a mass level, right? Even though people are asking for this kind of um, inter interaction, relationship, uh, it doesn't mean they all need it at the same level too. And, and I think that's a reality that we need to, uh, we need to acknowledge. I've been staring at a question here for a long time and I wanna to get to it because I think it's a really good one. And it's from Beatrice. It's about suggestions on getting those who've included you in their estate plan when they're reticent to share this conf confidential information. Uh, getting, I, I think what she's getting at is um, getting them to reveal themselves um, when, because it's confidential. I, I can take that if you want, Andrew, and, let, and, and um, if you wanna follow up. You go for it and I'll follow you. Okay, all right. Because I, I love this. I mean, a lot of what we've been saying today, I think, sets the groundwork for that, which is to say, if you've built trust, if you've built relationship, uh, they're more likely to tell you. Now, for some people, no amount of marketing, no amount of uh, engagement is going to get them to reveal it to you. They're just private people, and that's how it is, and that's how they are. However, you can continue to increase the number of, we, we always talk about the difference between reported and unreported. So you've got people who will tell you that you're in their will, um, and then you've got people who will put you in their will, and they just won't tell you. They're both good. <laughs> you just don't quite know who that, that second group yep. is um, until the day that Jesus calls them home, and then you get to find out uh, that wonderful uh, bit of news. Uh, but one thing we found is, and, and, and I love this, um, this is from Russell James, and many of you may be familiar with his work, but he, he gave the story, an example of a, a large national charity that uh, sent postcards, a, a short survey, to 35,000 of their best legacy prospects. And they asked questions like, um, how old are you? <laughs> how much are you worth? And uh, how are you feeling today? Now, it's a bit of an exaggeration, a little bit of an overstatement, but the point was it was a very transactional kind of survey. And uh, as Russell James tells the story, that uh, organization, 35,000 pieces of mail, zero, zero response to that. However, if you can ask questions like, How'd you first connect with us? What inspired your first gift? Why do you stay connected? Uh, what about our work is, are you most passionate about? Now suddenly you gave, engage them in a dialogue and it gives you the permission to ask that question and more will tell you. And I can tell you that's true because this is the kind of stuff we do every day. You start to ask that, you start to present it that way and you can get more people to talk about it. That's my answer. I don't know, Andrew, if you have anything you want to add or. No, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, and I think if you don't know Dr. James, you should absolutely look him up at Texas Tech. He's brilliant and has great insights. Um, so I think this is a particular challenge for ministry organizations because um, I, I think a lot of uh, donors who, who are believers feel like they're called to give without shining a light on it because they, they don't want to have that come across as, as any kind of, you know, arrogance or, or self-importance, right? They really want to, to be um, thoughtful and, and honoring to God in, in their giving. So I think, I think it's going to be harder just in general to get a believer to, to share that kind of information with you because they don't want it to, to feel like they're going against scripture, right? I, I do know, I, I had one client that I worked with years ago uh, they're a secular charity and an animal uh, welfare organization. They actually sent a postcard out. It was kind of kind of a tongue in you know tongue in cheek kind of thing, but around Valentine's Day, they sent a postcard out that said to their to their best donors. They had profiled you know uh, a legacy model, and, and it said something to the effect of, 
are you our secret admirer? Have <laughs> you planned for us in your will or estate plan and just not told us yet? And they actually ended up getting a significant number of people to raise their hands and say, yes, I had, uh, you know, you're, you're in my will and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, they, there might be some things like that that you could um, test around and, and you know, sort of that sort of thing. But I, I would also say like the last thing that I would want to encourage is um, scaring a donor off because it's a lot easier to be pulled out of a will than it is to be put in one. Um, so I would just say, be careful. I was, um, there was another question here and uh, I saw it earlier, I'm just trying to find it, but it has to do with uh, board. Um, and, and I think, you know, we've been talking a lot. I think some of the assumptions we've been making about are about large organizations. Let's shift down to smaller organizations and kind of wear that hat for a little bit. Um, maybe smaller staff, maybe uh, executive director does a, a bit of the fundraising as well. Um, there was a, uh, one person who said, hey, my board doesn't see it as their job to be involved in fundraising um, or does not feel obligated to assist in fundraising. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, first of all, I I think that this comes down to what are the expectations that we set when we recruit boards? Yeah. And what are we doing to equip and empower the board? I serve on a board right now. I've served on multiple boards. I've been a, a chair of several boards. And without fail, in almost every one of those instances, I joined and someone said, yeah, we're going to need you to help with fundraising. And that was the extent of the conversation. Right. right. Now, I happen to work in this industry. So I, you know, I know a lot more than the average board member, but most boards, most board members are overworked, overtaxed at home, have no idea what it means to actually do fundraising, um, and are scared to death that you're going to ask them to ask their friends for money. Right. So part of this needs to be in the interview process, in the vetting process, having really candid conversations about what it means. I actually favor the idea of building a checklist of all the different ways that board members can engage in philanthropy. And I think at the very bottom, I would put asking for money, right? I, I much prefer that board members help us open doors, help promote the organization, help share information, help connect you to the community and not worry about having them ask for money. In fact, a lot of board members it would scare me to death to have them asking for money just because they're they're not good at it. They're not comfortable with it. And why put somebody in that position if it's not something they're comfortable with, right? So, but I like to actually have the checklist and say to the board members, we ask every board member to commit to four of the things on this list. Which four would you be most comfortable with? And that's part of my vetting process. And if you can't agree to do that, then maybe you're not right for our board, right? Um, and, and then once you've got that information, you bring somebody onto the board, then it's our responsibility to train and equip them. So if we're not hosting a training session where we're actually walking the board members through, this is how you do these things. And these are the scripts that you use. This is the email template you can use, those kind of things. Um, then shame on us. That, that's our problem. That's a training problem. Just like you wouldn't expect to hire a brand new fundraiser who has no experience and put them out in the world and have them close six and seven figure gifts. It just doesn't happen, right? They need that training and development and coaching and encouragement. Um, and I think that that's something that, you know, can happen once in a formal way. And then really every board meeting, there ought to be some uh, aspect of the board conversation that centers around philanthropy and not just how much money came in last month, right? Mm -hmm. But let's tell a story of, you know, uh, a life that was impacted last month so that now you have another story to share when you're out doing the things in the community that you do regularly. And that's part of your ability to share our philanthropic message with the community. The advocacy is, is, is huge. And I think that's key to what, that's what I'm hearing. Yep. We are we are nearly at time and I, I don't like to go over. I have one other question I wanna put out there because I think it really fits our, our conversation. And then I will wrap things up here for expectations from leadership on receiving gifts versus the donor timeline. So let's just say, you know, C-suite says, hey, we need we need to hit our target by X date and donor donor timeline is just not quite aligned with that. Uh, thoughts on that one? Yeah, this is one reason why I don't love that, um, that we often um, uh, track fundraiser performance by dollars 
mm. because none of us can control the dollars, right? We can control the activities. We can control that we've presented a, a proposal. We've made an ask, but the amount of the gift and the timing of the gift are exclusively up to the donor. And so this is a this goes back to my point about organizations living paycheck to paycheck, right? If you have such thin margin in your organization that you um, that you have to be chasing dollars today, what that means is you're always going to get less than what that donor could give, right? And and so you've robbed both the 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 end recipient of your services by doing that, and you also rob the donor of their ability to be the most generous that they can be um, by chasing their money today. So um, like, like that's about capacity building. And it's also about understanding that we as fundraisers have zero control over amount and timing. Awesome. awesome. Andrew, thank you so much. This has been, uh, it's fun for me. I, I think it's by watching the chat, fun for our listeners. Uh, grateful for your insights, grateful for your expertise and for sharing them with us today. I'd like yeah, to, to be here. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to close our time, you know, at Money for Ministry. Our heart is to see the church thrive and flourish in all its forms. And we want to help so many ministries deepen relationships, uh, really so that lives can be healed and so that lives can be transformed by uh, the good news of the gospel. And so mm-hmm. uh, in that spirit, I'd like to close our time together uh, with these words from the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy, uh, words that I think uh, speak to uh, the heart of our discussion today. It's these words, but as for you, uh, continue in what you've learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation in Christ Jesus. And we pray, Father, that we be the kind of people who don't just raise money, but who help people everywhere, people who want to do good, uh, connect to your work, connect uh, to the mission of the gospel so that they can continue in what they've learned and become convinced of. Uh, Make us wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great day.